I've made this video in response to a pet peeve of mine that I've noticed online quite a lot lately, and that is concerning the safe bank angle to use in the pattern to avoid getting into a stall spin. Frequently that number is quoted at staying under 30 degrees of bank angle. Not only is that number completely arbitrary and bogus, it's not safe and it underlies a basic lack of understanding of the fundamental aerodynamics. So what I hope that you can get from this video is what the approach speed on the airplane should be based on the configuration, why we use that airspeed. It's not by accident. It's an airspeed that's done by design. And you'll see how that correlates to the load factor. And once you understand that, you'll know at any point in the pattern what your stall speed is and you'll know what your margin above stall is when you look at your airspeed indicator. And we're going to demonstrate this by cross-referencing the information in these various sources that I've compiled. And you're free to find more sources if you'd like. So the ones that we have are the FAA Flying Handbook. I've taken the Pilot's Operating Manual for the Cessna 172 because it's a very popular trainer. It's very likely that you're probably going to fly this as your first airplane. You're going to learn a lot of bad habits and then you'll get enlightened and you'll fly gliders and you'll have to unlearn those habits. But such is life. I've also got the Private Pilot Handbook by Jepson and then we'll tie this all back together again in the Art of Thermaling. So without further ado, let's delve into the actual science and engineering and numbers so that we can get a true understanding of what's happening. The first thing we're going to start with is a definition. And I'm going to define the pattern airspeed, which is V subscript pattern. And we're going to define that as 1.4 times VSO. And I'm going to define VSO as the stall speed of the airplane for a given configuration. And I'm going to define configuration to mean a combination of flaps, spoilers, speed brakes, and landing gear position, or any other device on the aircraft that would change the handling characteristics. So once again, it's 1.4 times the stall speed of the airplane, where the stall speed is a function of the configuration of the aircraft. And that definition is coming from page 8-2 in the pilot uh, FAA operating handbook. And you can see here at the top of page 8-2, it says, after turning onto the base leg, the pilot should start the descent with reduced power and airspeed of approximately 1.4 VSO. And then it goes on and gives some information and examples of how that affects the approach speed based on the stall speed of the airplane, but it doesn't give any real context other than that. But we'll get into that in a second. And so you can see that's coming from the Airplane Flying Handbook, and that's how we're getting our definition of pattern airspeed. The next thing we're going to do is turn to the Aircraft Operating Handbook, and we're going to look up the stall speeds of the aircraft, plug that into our formula, and calculate the theoretical approach speeds. In this case, I've gotten the 172Q model pilot's operating handbook. And in the very first page under performance specifications, I've highlighted stall speed, flaps up, power off, 53 knots, and flaps down, power off, 48 knots. So turning back to our equation over here on the piece of paper, we can see 53 knots for VSO clean and 48 knots for VSO dirty. If we multiply those two numbers respectively by 1.4, we'll see that 1.4 times 53 knots gives us an approach speed of 74.2, and that's with the flaps up. And similarly, 1.4 times 48 knots will give us 67.2 knots 
for the approach speed with the flaps down. So let's verify the mathematics of this equation that we use to calculate the approach speed with what is recommended in the pilot operating handbook. So I'm now going to switch over to normal procedures. And if we look, we see it says the airspeed is between 65 to 75 knots with the flaps up. And it's between 60 and 70 knots with the flaps down. So I've just rewritten what you just read over here on this piece of paper. And we can see they are actually in excellent agreement. As a matter of fact, we now have a little bit more knowledge than what was simply obtained from the pilot's operating handbook. We know from our formula that it's actually the high end of the spectrum that you want to be flying the approach speed relative to what the manual says. And we'll see why in a second when it comes to load factor and stall speed. So let's look at that next. So now let's see where the motivation for defining the pattern airspeed as 1.4 times VSTAL came from. And we can do that if we refer to the trusty load factor diagrams taken out of the Jepson training book. And here we can see that at 60 degree bank angle, the load factor goes by two. And similarly on page 3-61, we can re-represent this as percentage increase in stall speed as a function of bank angle. And what we'll notice immediately is that at 60 degrees bank angle, there's a 40% increase in stall speed. Hmm, that looks kind of familiar. Kind of like the definition of our approach speed. So you can see clearly the definition of the approach speed was made in such a way that the airplane would not stall until you reach 60 degrees of bank angle. So you can see quite clearly now, when people say that you should limit your bank angle to 30 degrees, it's complete nonsense. It's not based on any engineering. And it's a very lazy way of not taking the time to understand the fundamental aerodynamics of what's going on. So let's tie these numbers and this graph together in a tangible example of the Cessna 172. So remember our clean and dirty stall speeds were 53 knots and 48 knots respectively. So I've taken those numbers and I've made a chart where you can see what the stall speed is on the y-axis. So here's stall speed increasing as you go up and bank angle increasing as you go from left to right all the way up to 80 degrees of bank. And what this tells us is at 60 degrees of bank angle, the stall speed is going to be 67.2 and 74.2 knots indicated airspeed, which is the same values we calculated here. Furthermore, we can see that at 80 degrees of bank angle, the stall speed would be at 115.2 knots and 127.2 knots. So what I want you to take away from this graph is that you could, in theory, fly the pattern at an 80 degree bank angle if you were flying above 115 knots. You wouldn't stall, you wouldn't spin. It's a function of being coordinated and knowing where you are on this curve. And for those of you who are more mathematically inclined, the load factor is one over the cosine of the bank angle phi. And the stall speed, or the increase in stall speed, is the square root of that load factor. And you can reconstruct this curve. So I'm going to cut to another frame. And what I'm going to do is draw a line. And we'll, we'll be able to see or visualize in our mind 
what our stall margins are as we're flying in the pattern. So what I've done now is I've drawn two horizontal blue lines on our graph that represents the approach speeds that we calculated earlier as 1.4 times V stall. And we can see that the difference in height between this blue line and the black curved line is our stall margin. It's how many knots we could get slow from the approach speed until we stall the airplane. And we can look at the same type of uh, situation when we compare the upper blue line, which is the approach speed in the clean configuration with the flaps up, and how far down we have to go from this curve until we hit the red line at any given bank angle tells us how many knots of airspeed we can lose before we stall the airplane. So to make this a little bit easier to see pictorially, I've redrawn it to this graph here on the left, where this graph is basically the height difference between the blue line and the black curve, and the height difference between the blue line up top and the red curve. It's a graph of the stall margin. So we can see here the x-axis is again the bank angle in degrees. This time the y-axis is the stall margin. And what this shows us is that if we fly the approach speed the entire time in the pattern at zero degrees bank angle, we have 19.2 knots for the flaps down and 21.2 knots that we could get slow relative to the approach speed before we stall. That's a tremendous buffer. Here's the magical 30 degrees bank angle. And you can see at 30 degrees, We've got 15.6 for the flaps down and 17.2 knots for the flaps up in terms of airspeed we could lose before we stall. That's a tremendous buffer. There's no reason why the buffer needs to be that big. And in fact, I've called out the 45 degree bank angle and put a red box around it to basically bust this myth. At 45 degree bank angle with the flaps down, we've got 10.11 knots of buffer from our approach speed before we stall with the flaps down, and we've got 11.17 knots we could lose with the flaps up before we stall. It should be perfectly within the capabilities of any licensed proficient pilot to maintain plus or minus 10 knots airspeed on approach in the pattern. In fact, you should be able to do much better than that. If you have a lot of experience in your particular airplane and you've been flying it for a while, there's no reason why you couldn't fly plus or minus five or two knots of airspeed. So you can see there's nothing inherently unsafe with flying the pattern at a 45 degree bank angle. You've got a very wide margin that you can get down in airspeed. And if we continue, we can see that there's no margin. Essentially, you will be stalled at 60 degree bank angle. And that's precisely because the approach speed was 1.4 times VSO. And you have a 40% increase in stall speed at 60 degrees bank. So there's no margin left over. So the main takeaway is I hope the next time you fly, you think about this curve, well, I hope you actually take the time to make this curve for your airplane, use the numbers in your pilot operating handbook, and as you're flying, you'll be able to know intuitively where you are on this curve as you're banking the airplane in the pattern and flying your approach speed. And that will tell you how much margin you have before you stall the airplane. There should be no guessing games involved. At any given bank angle, at any point in time, you'll know exactly how safe you are. And another interesting thing this graph shows is that you have less margin of safety when the flaps are down as opposed to when the flaps are up. So keep that in mind the next time you're flying. So to come full circle, 
And to kind of make a point about that little jab at the beginning of this video where I talked about learning how to fly correctly when you fly gliders, I wanted to kind of emphasize the acute attention that you'll pay to airspeed once you start transitioning into high performance gliders. There's one particular airspeed when you're in a thermal which is known as minimum sink. And at that forward airspeed or indicated airspeed, the downward component of airspeed or VSI will be minimized. And that's the airspeed you want to maintain to do a tight 45 degree turn at minimum airspeed in the thermal to rise as quickly as you can and move on to your next waypoint. And if I switch to the back, you can see essentially this is the same calculation we just did but with a different application. We've got the minimum sink airspeed for zero degree bank angle, in this case for different types of aircraft. So let's look at the case of a the first aircraft where the minimum sink is 40 knots or 40 miles per hour depending on the airplane. We'll assume that it's knots for this case. So at zero degree bank angle, minimum sink is 40 knots. But you can see at 45 degrees, we've got 1.4 Gs, that's the same 1.4 we saw earlier, and the new minimum sink airspeed is 48 knots. And at 30 degrees, it's 44 knots. And so you can see as we're flying the glider, we're constantly adjusting our airspeed down to the knot or mile per hour based on the bank angle. And we're also making adjustments for airspeed down to the mile per hour or not if we're going somewhere with a headwind or a tailwind or if we're in rising or sinking air. So you're constantly adapting the airspeed to optimize for performance. And that's one thing you don't do in a powered airplane because you've got the engine to basically compensate for sloppiness. Here's the last reference I want to highlight. It's on Transition to Gliders by Tom Knopf. He's a very well-known and respected author in the glider world and helped the FAA publish the uh, training manual for glider pilots as well. And if we turn to the section on rope break, it essentially discusses the procedure you should do if the rope breaks on tow. So if you're not familiar with gliders, the way we get in the air is that we've got a rope that's attached to a tow plane, and that tow plane gets us up to altitude, and then we release. Now, on a powered airplane, you're taught to have at least 800 feet altitude AGL before you turn back to the field. And that's because your powered airplane is very low performance. On a glider, you can turn back to the field as low as 200 feet AGL. However, if you read the text, it says the best and safest turn close to the ground is a 45 degree angle of bank. Of course, you must be more than one half the wingspan above the ground and consider wind gradient and turbulence. So you can see we're doing an extremely tight 45 degree bank angle turn at 200 feet AGL to get back to the field. So there really is no excuse to be afraid to fly 45 degrees bank angle in a powered airplane as long as you're conscious of your airspeed. So I've decided to conclude this video by showing pictorially what is the dangerous situation you can be in. And that's when you're doing a skidding turn, which is shown here on the bottom figure where the yaw string is pointing towards the inside of the turn, or for the powered pilots, the ball on the turn and slip indicator has swung to the outside wing of the turn. In this case, if you were to stall the airplane, you're very likely to enter a spin because the airplane's uncoordinated. You have a high angle of attack, which is exceeding the critical angle of attack of the wing, so you're stalled, and that's compounded with a side slip angle, which is causing that yaw string to move towards the inside wing or the downward wing on the turn. Now, if your mentality is to never fly more than 30 degrees of bank angle, and you find that you're not quite lined up with the runway correctly, 
the only option you have left at your disposal is to use rudder to swing the nose because you've artificially limited yourself to 30 degrees of bank angle. And once you get into that mentality, you're much more likely to start skidding the airplane and not paying attention to what's going on when the proper and correct course of action is to roll and bank the airplane up to and including 45 degrees while keeping it coordinated and on airspeed. If you find that 45 degrees of bank angle is still not working out to get you lined up correctly, at that point you need to abort the approach and try it again. That, in my opinion, is a much safer way to fly the airplane because you understand what the airplane's doing and you're correctly banking to turn by tilting the lift vector to turn the airplane as opposed to torquing the airplane with the rudder which is going to skid it.